Here's where I'd like to begin. Back in January, when we spoke in Davos, you made a bold and I would say scary prediction that financial markets in 2018 could end up looking a lot like 1994, a year in which a lot of people lost a lot of money. What do you think now? I think that could still happen. And again, 94 was a year where earnings were actually quite good. So um, I think we have the same benefit of a relatively good earnings outlook right now with taxes lower, with capital expenditures being accelerated, with unemployment decreasing, and generally the business outlook pretty good. But you have the Fed raising rates. Um, we've, we've started to see a lot of volatility since our meeting in Davos, Eric. I mean, I think the market's down about 5% since then. Uh, and you have a lot of sources of volatility going forward as well, between Korea, trade, tariffs, uh, the Trump investigation in Russia, et cetera. There are a lot of things that could introduce volatility in the market. So we'll just have to see how they play out. What about quantitative easing? I know it's something that you've been paying close attention to, and it's certainly been a dominant feature in financial markets of the post-crisis landscape. Yeah, last year, actually, there was a lot more uh, monetary injection in the system, if you will, particularly in Europe and Japan, than uh, people really realize. And that's really being taken away as well. So. We'll have to see how that all adds up, but it would not surprise me at all to see us end the year with rates a little higher than people expect. We don't predict rates, but I think that uh, we try to protect ourselves against the asymmetry of getting it wrong. And right now, rates are still not super high, and spreads have gotten tighter, which is why high yield hasn't done so badly. How important to you is that 3% threshold on the 10-year Treasury? I, th I think it's important, but I think the spread of that versus other risk assets, such as high yield, are sometimes more important. And right now, spreads are relatively low. If you notice, high yield's actually relatively flat for the year in spite of a pretty bad year for Treasuries. So we'll, we'll see how that evolves, but generally that's not a good entry point in par assets. No, it's not. However, uh, not being a good entry point does not necessarily mean overpriced. What's your view on the relationship? Not necessarily, not necessarily if you're going to hold them over the cycle. But as I, as I said, one of the issues um, <clears throat> right now is we're still in a world where people are hungry for yield. Uh, they're not as aggressive in terms of enforcing uh, creditor rights as maybe one would like creditors to be. So we'd prefer buying things that are stressed or distressed or trading uh, when, when someone's either at a moment where they're forced to sell or where the market has having a hiccup so it's not able to accommodate the new capital at a low rate. So to that point, 2006 and 2007 were in retrospect marked by some seriously undisciplined, irresponsible, maybe cavalier risk taking by investors in many regions around the globe and principally in credit, right? Products they didn't understand, big decline in underwriting standards. Do you see that happening now? Well, I would, only, I would take a little issue with you on some of that in 06 and 07, because I think bank debt essentially rode through fine. Now, everything went from 95 to 60 to right. par along the way. But what was missed in 08 was the incredible structural imbalance going on with the banks. Banks had huge leverage on their own balance sheets and were transmitting that leverage in incalculable ways to others. But today, it's different in the sense that the things that have been done to make the banks safer have maybe made the rest of the world less safe. And that's the point that I would really emphasize. So the next blow-up is going to be where? Well, I think there's a big liquidity mismatch that's been building like crazy away from the banks. The banks themselves, of course, aren't using their balance sheets so aggressively at all because of the Volcker rule, because they've had to pull their horns in, because their own equity is much larger and their leverage is lower. But I think if you look at where capital has gone, it's gone in 40 Act funds, it's gone in mutual funds, it's gone in low fee index products, where there's a mismatch between the assets that they hold, such as bonds, and even equities for that matter, and the liabilities where they have to give their, their shareholders 24-hour liquidity. Why isn't anybody doing anything about this? Well, a lot of people are talking about yes. it, uh, but it's not clear that there's a lot to do about it. These are not viewed by the government as institutions that are critical necessarily, the way the banks are critical. So in creating the safety in that part of the financial system, there is a lot of uh, potential perils outside, which are opportunities. Josh, I know you've been paying close attention to the controversy over the refinancing deal that Blackstone's GSO credit business did for the home builder, Hovnanian. What's your view? Is it right to engineer a default? Um, it's a good question. It's a, it's a tough question. 
Um, there are certain things that sort of go beyond the bounds of the way we'd like to act ourselves as a firm, and, and I think that's one of them. There's a way we'd like to be treated by others in the market, and there's a way we treat others. And, and my own view, and this is really just a personal view as opposed to a firm view, although I think the whole firm has, shares the same view, uh, certain things really go a step beyond where we would be willing to feel comfortable. Would you call it manipulation? I don't know that I would put a label on it, but I would say it Is it unseemly? It's certainly a little unseemly. <laughs> Is the integrity of the CDS market in question here? Well, I think if you have practices like that that seem to go against the original intent of, uh, of CDS, which is supposed to be triggered by an actual default of payments um, as opposed to one that was negotiated, uh, seems to me to be one that calls into question your ability to use those instruments for the functions for which they were created. But let's explore that for just a moment. If you can't use those instruments, if you can't use those swaps to hedge your exposure, perhaps even to speculate, heavens no speculation, what happens then? What's the outcome? What's the end result? Well, Why should people it, care? Well, it, I think that people want to have contracts that they can use to, to hedge and to protect against risk in their portfolios or to create risk in their portfolios, and those have to be predictable. So the rules will get established one way or the other. Either this will be okay or it won't be okay. Uh, the rules may or may not be changed, and then that'll be the end of it, and we won't probably be talking about it anymore. But when you get to the edge like this, it gets people really uncomfortable. If you had your way, should the CFTC shut it down? Um, I, I think it's time to shut that one down.